Hello, welcome everyone to Proto Talks, our fifth installment um, thus far. I'm your host, Matt Morgan. I'm the president of Protogetic, the protective design industry's first digital marketplace. Before we get started, I'd like to give a big thank you to Stone Security Engineering, our sponsor. Stone Security Engineering has been very, very supportive of us throughout the last years, and we thank them for their continued partnership and participation today. So thank you. Uh, today's 75 minute discussion features a very serious topic that every year becomes more and more important, hostile vehicle mitigation. Um, today we have some of the leading experts in their fields with us to talk about protection strategies, primarily for urban events. Um, you, you just, you cannot save lives and protect property if you are not employing and deploying the proper defense systems. So I know this topic is going to be insightful to all of us, given that the Super Bowl is this Sunday and the Olympics right now are, are ongoing. So, so let's get to it and bear with me for a moment because our, our keynote speaker today, Rob Ryder, um, really does have some exceptional experience and, and uh, credentials that I really want to get right. So if you'll bear with me, let me read this um, because it really is uh, something impressive. Uh, Rob Ryder is a national subject matter expert in both perimeter security and the protection and safety of pedestrians in crowded places and retail locations. He is chairman of the Perimeter Security Subcommittee for the Security Industry Association, which is now writing new guidelines to address hostile vehicle attacks and mitigation. Rob is also co-chair of the ASTM F12-10 subcommittee that developed test standards for low speed safety barriers and secretary of the full F12-10 committee responsible for high-speed anti-terrorist barrier standards, okay? For more than 20 years, Rob has focused his efforts on both high security and public safety measures to protect people and property from accidental or deliberate vehicle incursions. And in 2012, Rob co-founded the Storefront Safety Council, an advocacy organization focused on tracking and preventing vehicle into building crashes. Trust me, you are not going to find someone more passionate about this topic than Rob Ryder. So I would like to welcome Rob to Proto Talks. Rob, how are you? And welcome, my friend. It's uh, it's not been too long, but always good to see you. Well, it's good that you say I'm the most passionate around because if you said I was the smartest around, 50 people would be rolling their eyes right now and going, what is this? <laughs> this is crazy. I'm, yeah. I'm a lot of things, but I'm not the smartest guy in, in even a virtual room. Well, but, that makes two of us. So great. So yeah, great. but everybody knows that about you. They're not so sure about me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to be uh, rambling a little bit because I think we need just a little bit of perspective and 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 some sort of context. But I'm going to run through a thousand slides in about twelve minutes. So um, everybody needs to kind of hang on to their hat. Is that okay with you? That's fine. Let's get started. All right. There you go. Um, but here I am. So um, yes, I am in fact that guy. Um, and I have in fact been doing this for longer than most people um, realize. And somehow it's all blown through awfully quickly for me as well. Um, one of the things that I do want to mention today is I have been blessed by a lot of friendships and a lot of mentors in this industry. Um, and as I reach, oh, I don't know, 39 or whatever I am now, um, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to encourage people to become more involved in the industry and to become more involved as professionals. Um, there's a lot of things that people need to teach and a lot of things that people need to, to communicate. So that's one of the reasons why we're here. And I want to thank Protogetic for being um, really forthright about that and, and taking leadership. So uh, as, as mentioned, I co-founded the Storefront Safety Council. I spent an awful lot of my time looking at bonehead stuff. Uh, bonehead stuff in terms of what drivers do, bonehead stuff in terms of what parking lots are designed to do, and bonehead stuff uh, day after day, the same sorts of accidents happening at the same sorts of locations, same sorts of restaurants and store chains. Um, it's great fun and very frustrating at the, at the same time. Uh, as you can see, storefront crashes happen 20,000 times a year, and most of them are about like this. 
driver slammed into a Starbucks store. Chopper 7 HD was open his seat in Matheson late today. Police say an elderly woman hit the gas instead of the brake and drove straight into that store. Fortunately, no one was seriously hurt. I always like the part of that where the cop is picking up the ADA sign, breaking it off and tossing it out because it's probably the fourth time it's been hit. Um, our database uh, involving um, retail oriented um, crashes, uh, crashes into commercial buildings, government buildings and bus stops. Uh, we have over 24,000 incidents that are logged and cataloged. Uh, we have another 12,000 incidents, which we have record of, but, but not in, in sufficient, sufficient information um, to, to make them fully logged in. But as you can see, um, retail stores and restaurants, number one uh, places people do these things. Um, the age spread of accidents, you know, uh, it, it skews slightly towards older drivers, but not as much as many people think. Um, and the frequent causes, as you can see, the steady ones is that, that little over 40% that are just operator error and driver error. It, it hasn't changed much in the last six years. Um, I don't expect it to change much in the next six years. But today we're really talking mostly about um, what's going on on streets and for special events and for um, uh, times when, when streets are used for things other than vehicular traffic. Um, I sometimes call this um, turning a, a street into an entertainment venue. Um, but as you can see in the, in the graphic, lots of cities because of COVID decided that restaurants needed to move outside. And so they put people closer and closer to traffic. Um, and a big topic today is there's a good way to do that and a not so good way to do that. And here's a surprise. I'm going to be talking mostly about the not so good way to do that. Um, here are two photos of ways that various cities have um, decided that um, putting people into outdoor dining works. Um, I love the picture of the fire engine ba barely able to pass. I think that's a, an interesting um, uh, lack of standards there. And then um, the picture on the other side where you have people sitting and there are flower pots and a yellow line um, protecting them from traffic. I think, I think that's an interesting innovation in, in public safety as well. Um, we, we experienced uh, from the start of the pandemic to about a couple of months ago when I ran the numbers, um, we saw approximately a 25 um, uh, accidents that we saw at restaurants and outdoor dining went up about 25 times. Um, we were used to seeing four to eight a year. We saw um, close, closer to 100 of them, uh, I think in the first 16 months of the pandemic. So there, there's a lot going on with the interface of vehicle traffic and outdoor dining. Um, this is gonna be one of the main topics that uh, the two smart guys uh, in the presentation will be talking about is how do you protect people who are um, just inches away from oncoming traffic? Um, this is a picture of an accident in Santa Monica, a drunk driver in a small BMW um, misjudged a corner and ran into and injured some people who were dining uh, outside on the, on the curbside dining. And you'll notice there that there's a barrier tipped over. Um, Jersey barriers, just because they're heavy, doesn't mean that they can actually protect a vehicle. We know this from things like this, where, where they've just been tipped over by a simple uh, collision, but we also know that because we test these things. Just because it's heavy doesn't mean it's a vehicle stopping barrier. And cities have done all kinds of things that maybe seemed like a good idea at the time, but when it comes to being a crash tested barrier that will protect people on the other side of it, they have not done as good a job as, as I think many of us would like. Um, for example, here's a street. Is this street open to traffic or closed to traffic? We see lots of barriers. We see some tents. It reminds me of uh, Denver Airport. Um, but is this, is this a closed street or an open street? So we look more closely at the sign there. And what it says is, please watch for people exiting the tents. My guess is that's a, that's a, a street that is open to vehicular traffic. Is it smart to be that open to vehicular traffic with that many people who might be walking back and forth? I think it's easier to close the street off. But this is part of the lack of standards that uh, the other speakers will be addressing uh, and something that, that I work on all the time. 
Now let's talk about street events that are a little bit different. This is this is downtown downtown New Orleans, um, and as you can see in the picture on the left, people are walking past the "Hey, this street is closed" bike rack that has been uh, the main method of closing streets off for special events for I don't know how many dozens of years. And on the right is a different corner of the same street that has uh, crash rated barriers installed. Um, New Orleans went through a, a program to improve security against um, deliberate acts of terrorism using a vehicle because they have some of the most crowded streets in the nation when um, with Friday nights and Saturday nights, much less on and Mardi Gras nights. But as you can see from the picture on the left, that's an incident that happened about eight years ago at a Mardi Gras parade, not downtown, where a, a young kid in a Ford F-150 who blew, as I recall, a 0 0.240 um, or three times the legal limit, um, ran into a crowd of about 25 people who were standing watching the parade in the median of a street, which means coming down the street on the left side was the parade where he ran into one of the, one of the float trucks. Um, but on the right-hand side where he came from, it was just open to traffic. So they had thousands of people on that grass median just watching something unprotected on their right. And, and folks that have seen my slideshows before or who have an interest in it, that photo on the right is uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma State um, homecoming parade where a car went through an intersection um, that was uh, only blocked off by a police motorcycle parked sideways. Uh, she hit and killed four people and she injured, as I recall, something like 46 people. Um, this, is, this is not all that uncommon. Um, events like marathons where you have, you know, so many exposures are, are, are risky and people like Jeff Hallett and, and Scott Rosenblum and people who I've been working with for years at ASTM are very conscious of the fact that there's, there's just not enough protection for the public who are mostly minding their own business and the last thing on their mind is watching out for vehicles because they assume the city has closed the street. If you, even if you just see an orange cone, you assume that somebody has made the area where you are safe. And it's just not always true. Um, this is an impact uh, five years ago at Times Square. I'll let it speak for itself for a second. Okay, that, that, that vehicle came down the sidewalk. He had killed one person and hit about 25. And he ran into a row of bollards. Um, that were put in as part of the Times Square Plaza improvement um, because uh, tourists and people walking around and, and people on foot going to their offices can't be watching over their shoulder every second to find out if there's a car coming down the sidewalk behind them. So New York City and the Times Square people said, we will protect this area so people don't have to have perfect situational awareness. Now, what it doesn't show in that frame is in the path of the vehicle, if those bollards weren't there, there was 300 people sitting at tables having lunch. It was a beautiful uh, spring day, uh, quite warm, and there was just a ton of people there. If they hadn't had the foresight to put in those barriers, probably would have been one of the bigger body counts uh, in, 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 in this category of, of tragedy in the United States. Uh, and this is the one that really got me started in this in this business of protecting people. Um, this is the Santa Monica Farmers Market 2003. I believe an 84 year old man driving a Buick um, for various reasons that have been ascribed, um, either made a pedal error or had some sort of a psych psychotic moment, uh, drove a thousand feet down um, Farmers Market um, on Third Street. He killed 10 people outright. He puts more than 60 in the hospital. Um, and back when $24 million was a lot of money, $24 million is what the city paid out in settlements. I don't know what that would be now, almost uh, 20 years later, but it would be a lot. Um, you can see the state of the vehicle and how many things he had to hit to have that vehicle look like that. Um, at the end of the investigation into this, the National Transportation Safety Board said, if they had made a traffic plan, they would have realized that they needed to close off the end of the street with some sort of a steel barrier. Um, in, in many cases, that's a, a bar or, or, a, or bollards or wedges, 
Um, but for something that happens every single week, it is cheaper and safer to make a permanent barrier, operable, removable, or whatever, but to prevent these sorts of very predictable, very foreseeable, and very tragic incidents. Alas, 19 years later in Waukesha, Wisconsin, just two months ago, um, a gentleman drove down a parade route that was not blocked off, and he killed uh, six people, and he injured 62. Um, and the videos of that are just absolutely horrific, so I'm not going to show them all. But this is just a screen capture from CNN. On the left is the police chief saying, gee, we did this the same way we do it every year. We did the best we knew how to do. And on the right is a picture of the vehicle um, driving over some plastic barriers that weren't really even set up. Cities need to do better, and the industry needs to do better in leading the way. Now we have the problem of the deliberate vehicle attacks. On the left is the van attack in Toronto that uh, killed 10 people. On the right is the New York bikeway attack uh, that killed eight people. Um, and people for various reasons, uh, ideology or whatever, will use their vehicles as a terrorist weapon of mass destruction. And it has happened many, many times around the world. Um, we call this terror by truck. On the left is the truck that struck the Berlin uh, Christmas market and killed a dozen people. On the right um, is the aftermath in Nice, France, a few years, uh, uh, gosh, about eight years ago now, that killed or injured over 200 people. Um, simple breach of security, um, poor training, poor execution, and 200 people dead and injured. And, and I love this photo because this is the, the truck that was rented from Home Depot that was used in the bikeway attacks that killed those people. Um, you too can be a terrorist for just $19. Um, I think the, the lesson here is that um, cities have to understand that they have an obligation. The industry needs to do a better job of saying, hey, there's some good solutions here. And, and one of the great things about Protogetic and, and putting on these sorts of talks is it raises the level of discussion. We'll be talking about it at ISC West in our uh, perimeter security subcommittee meeting. Um, there'll be an additional um, SIA event in uh, 24 and 25 May in Washington, DC. Um, and we, we're actively looking for greater involvement. And just because you got to end with a video, this strikes me as being about the level of security for public events on streets that most cities like to do. Sometimes I just want to watch that like three or four times. So Matt, uh, this was a, a, a fast moving yet nevertheless rambling uh, manifesto that between everyday accidents and, and accidents uh, at, at special events, and now the increased risk of people who, who are moved off the beach and into the water where the sharks are by being put in you know, curbside dining situations, sure. between, between accidents and deliberate acts, this is a really scary thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, some of the some of the pictures and photographs, videos that uh, you showed, Rob, are, are bone chilling. And, and it just really drives home the fact that that cities need to do a much better job in protecting their citizens on this kind of stuff. There's, it's, and that's that's why we do this. Thanks for putting this thing on. And, and now the smart people can do a better job. <laughs> well, all right. Thank you, Rob, very much. I appreciate that. Um, our next guest, um, again, uh, a, an accomplished um, professional in, in his own right. And, and again, let me get this right. With more than 30 years of experience in the protective design industry, Shannon Aharts is a registered professional engineer and vice president at Kimley Horn. His expertise encompasses managing and designing multidisciplined infrastructure projects, including security features to protect pedestrians from hostile and errant vehicles. Shannon Aharts managed the fast track high profile design that installed, installed more than 6,000 high security bollards and protection measures against the Las Vegas Strip, thereby protecting hundreds of thousands of people 
on a daily basis. Um, and he is no stranger to large event crowds and, and protecting them as well. So let me welcome Shannon Ahartz from Kimley Horn. Shannon, are you, are you out there? I am. Uh, good morning, Matt. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction. Uh, and uh, great job, uh, uh, Rob, and, and uh, with your presentation. And, and hopefully, um, in contrast to Rob's presentation, I'm hopeful to show the, the right way to, to, to do and protect uh, people from hostile vehicles. Uh, with that, let me get my screen set up here. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you, Matt. And uh, it, it's a pleasure to be a part of, of the CODA Talks today. Uh, again, great job, uh, Rob. Uh, lots of great examples there. Um, and uh, I, uh, as, as Matt mentioned, uh, I, I live and work in Las Vegas. And Las Vegas is no stranger to large events. Um, so I kind of just like to set up the, the uh, background here. Um, many times in Vegas, we have multiple events happening. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, sometimes they're simultaneous. Like this, this past weekend, we actually had the uh, National Hockey League All-Star Weekend here in town. And at the same time, we had the NFL Pro Bowl, uh, two really major events. And this is all on top of what is already kind of our normal uh, things that go on in the Strip in terms of concerts and activities uh, all up and down the Strip. Um, one of the things that there, as you see the uh, stats on the screen, um, uh, we, we like to say that, that everything happens in Las Vegas, but uh, there are similar events like this that occur uh, throughout uh, other cities and locations around the country as well. And then uh, while we're not at pre-COVID numbers yet, Las Vegas is on the rebound. According to the Las Vegas uh, Convention and Visitors Authority, uh, in 2019, we saw about 42 and a half million people and about 32.2 million of those folks uh, just came back in 2021. And as you can see there too, from a convention standpoint, 2019, we saw just a little over six and a half million people and with about 2.2 million people returning in 2021. Uh, and just a quick plug for ISC West, uh, coming up here in the middle of March, uh, hope to see you all here in Vegas. One of the things that is, is for certain is that the economic in impact of visitors and tourists is enormous in Las Vegas. And so I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, tourists are uh, one of the key assets uh, here in Vegas. So what does this all mean? How do we go about providing mitigation to minimize the threats from hostile vehicles? Well, I'd like to, to think of it in terms of two unique deployment strategies. And uh, playing on our words of our Puerto Talk theme today, the two types are really zone defense and spot defense. Um, there are several similarities between these two strategies, but there are also uh, several different considerations to take into account. And I'll try to point these out as uh, we move through some of the examples. For instance, uh, here in Vegas, um, I would consider uh, the, the, a zone defense being a uh, kind of along a path, if you will. So think of the strip in Las Vegas. And people are moving from um, a, a position to another position. For instance, maybe resort to resort or between a resort to a venue, or perhaps even uh, between rideshare to venues or vice versa. And uh, it could actually be a resorts to convention centers or even between the convention centers uh, here in Vegas. And then I would actually define spot defense as generally where people are gathering more in just one location or in a general location. They're a little bit more confined and not moving uh, along a, a specified path necessarily. Um, so again, one of the best examples of a zone defense is really along the Las Vegas Boulevard or the Strip. 
Uh, there can be a lot of times up to 100,000 pedestrians a day or more uh, that are moving up, up and down the strip. And while the photo you see is actually a pre-COVID and actually a pre-Bollards uh, photo, it's a good example of how pedestrians are packed into the, the sidewalk area and how they were really unprotected and vulnerable uh, at the time this photo was taken. Uh, as, a, as a practicing engineer, I had to, to uh, add something to the slides that looks a bit like a, an equation. So the first bullet here uh, shows the uh, length along the strip that has some form of mitigation. So nine miles of mitigation, that's a lot of zone defense. Uh, that mitigation is made up of a lot of different uh, types, everything from bollards to walls, to planters, uh, even elevated walkways. And the other thing that's kind of interesting about this is that um, for a lot of it, the, the construction or the, the properties are existing. So it, the, the, the mitigation was, was kind of an afterthought. We had, to, we had to design it to fit in with what was already at, at an existing condition. Versus some locations along the strip, there, was, there, there is new, new construction. And when that happens, we can actually integrate uh, security and design into the design plans right from the get-go. And that makes a, a huge difference in the way that some of these things get implemented. Um, protecting a zone requires a, a, a really a great deal of flexibility due to the multiple ele elements that you need to deal with. Um, all of the bullets you see here on this slide are really mission critical items to consider when you're working to implement a project. For instance, the, uh, there's various property types. Uh, if you think about it along the strip, we have everything from, of course, the resorts and the casinos to souvenir shops, uh, to restaurants, to even gas stations. And so each one of those uh, are very unique. And of course, uh, just the numerous properties owners up and down the strip uh, causes a, a great deal of, of, of coordination between all those owners. And with those different types, you're gonna run across a myriad of different site conditions. And of course you have to deal with easements um, and that could be for construction or for uh, eventual perpetual maintenance on uh, the mitigation that is installed. Uh, likewise, operation and maintenance. Uh, every one of these properties have different requirements, different ways that they uh, maintain or have to access uh, their properties or their frontage, frontages. So having uh, upfront discussions with, with them and how this is gonna work is, is certainly a key item. Scheduling and phasing. Uh, getting a job done like this up and down the strip, uh, there's always something going on and there's always a reason to uh, skip this area or do something at this time versus another time. Uh, and with uh, nine miles to cover up and down the strip, uh, it certainly was a challenge. And of course, aesthetics. Um, anytime you get more people in the room to decide on how something's going to actually look, uh, the more challenging that becomes. Uh, however, I will say that uh, the, the, the owners and the strip, the corridor, uh, really did come together and, uh, and settled on a look for the strip. And it has actually become uh, really a look uh, for the uh, whole Las Vegas Valley. And of course, on any project, you have the utility coordination and ADA issues that you need to deal with. Um, the photo you see here is really, it's an example of uh, some M50 P1 shallow mount bollards that were part of the first installation along the strip. And uh, these proved to be very effective uh, in terms of being able to just uh, get over most of the utility conflicts. And also uh, they're, they're pretty quick to get installed. Um, so that allowed uh, many of the walkways to be restored back to um, an open phase so that uh, uh, people could continue to use those walkways, which was important to all of the, the stakeholders. Um, so here, this, this particular uh, 
photo here is a uh, photo of uh, some pollards that are were installed along the frontage of Bellagio. And uh, these were actually a trench type of installation. And what we found was that uh, in many cases, uh, just trying to fit um, uh, bollards in on any given property was much like doing a, a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, we had to use a, a, a lot of different uh, types of foundations and a lot of different configurations uh, just to fit the sites and minimize impacts. Um, so it, it really what happens is you really have to understand and identify constraints and upfront and then the design process just becomes pretty iterative, uh, very iterative uh, before you get it all finalized. Again, uh, these were uh, trench uh, type bollards and, and one of the reasons we had to do that here in front of the Bellagio is because of uh, all of the trees that line the street there in front of the, the fountains and the tree wells and all of the different uh, elements that, that go along with that. Um, the shallow frames just would not fit and uh, the spacing of bollards we, was not gonna be uh, adequate unless we went to this type of method. And so uh, in the end, uh, this is how it turned out. Uh, we ended up with a nice, uh, good looking um, row of bollards that protects the tens of thousands of people that are usually at the fountains uh, every, every day. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, I was able to take several of these photos during the pandemic, so that you don't see a lot of folks out there at the moment, but um, it does give a chance to actually highlight the bollards themselves. Um, one of the next, next photo here is um, also an example of some finished bollards. Uh, these were uh, shallow mount bollards, M50P1s, which basically all of the bollards along the, the, the strip are M50P1s. Um, but one of the things that I'd like to point out here, as I mentioned, is ADA is, is, a, is a big uh, design component. And so every one of these curb ramps uh, were all custom designed to meet ADA um, compliance. The other thing that happens is that um, there's an interface generally between uh, public uh, property and private property. In this case, and in many cases on the strip, the actual public right-of-way or the property line um, actually runs down somewhere in the middle or some portion of the sidewalk. So this side over here being the private property side, this side over here being the uh, public side. So if you can imagine where that line would come out here, it's, it's likely that these three bollards are actually on private property, um, which again uh, means that you have to have uh, construction easements uh, and you have to interface with that private property. The other thing that happened quite often was, particularly when we did use shallow mount bollards, the frame, the ends of the frames, um, many times projected into the uh, uh, property, uh, uh, private property beyond the, the right-of-way line. So again, requiring uh, that interface between public and private and having to work out uh, easements and uh, maintenance agreements uh, for these. But uh, in the end, um, it really did uh, seal up uh, the walkways and made them quite safe or a lot safer. This is actually one of my favorite videos that I like to show. And this is an ADA consideration that you may not think about initially, but it's really important that it's, it's considered upfront um, because you don't wanna have to re this this uh, after the fact. And what this is, is it's a, a video of um, one of our bus stops along the, the strip. And uh, many of the buses, as you might, uh, as you'll see here, have multiple doors. And those doorways need to line up with the openings and spacing of the bollards. Um, that the last thing that you want to happen is that a bus pulls up and you end up with a bollard that might actually uh, fall within uh, the opening of the doorway. Um, seems easy enough, but if it's not something that's um, planned for up front, 
um, this can easily be missed and, and get all, all mixed up. Uh, this particular uh, site was also interesting because uh, the bus stop site actually has uh, two different buses that stop at this site. And as you can imagine, the dimensions of the bus uh, is different and the door alignments are different. Um, however, um, with that configuration that we were able to work out, um, it, the spacing of the bollards um, worked for both bus configurations. So we consider that a success story on this, on, uh, for an ADA situation on the strip. Uh, a couple of other examples of zone defense uh, include, uh, as I mentioned, moving people from uh, resorts to venues. Uh, what you see in this photo is people moving from the res uh, resort corridor of the strip uh, along the Hacienda Bridge over to Allegiant Stadium, which is the uh, home of the, of the Las Vegas Raiders. What happens is they shut down the uh, north side of this bridge and it becomes a dedicated uh, pedestrian path um, to move uh, pedestrians between the strip and the Legion Stadium. Now, this is a, an example of a temporary situation. Um, this uh, only is in place when there are events at the stadium. Another example is um, uh, a venue to a rideshare lot. Um, in this case, this is a T-Mobile Arena. And people, when people uh, either leave or are coming to the arena, basically they follow this path and, to the rideshare lot. And since this is a permanent path, there is permanent protection along this entire path. But that's just another example of what I, again, what I would call zone defense. Um, Let's move on to some spot defense situations, which uh, can be similar to zone defense, but with a couple of added uh, considerations or a, a couple of different types of uh, mitigation. Uh, T-Mobile Arena, home of the Golden Knights. Let's go Knights. Uh, this is a situation, as you can see here, where um, people gather mostly or generally in one location or more of a confined location, uh, like in this case, out on the plaza uh, in front of T-Mobile Arena. Um, however, there are people that, that, that access this area from all around uh, the venue itself. And so many times what happens in these types of situations, the entire venue um, has its perimeter um, protected with some, some type of mitigation. And so when that happens, when the entire perimeter is, 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 has some kind of mitigation, um, there's a need to, to secure access points or to have access points that are secured. And so um, these access points will generally require some form of active barrier. Uh, whether it be a, a, a wedge or a retractable bollard or, or some, some form of a gate. The other thing with this, with these access points, is because now they are not readily accessible uh, and you, they're, they're shut off or closed down, you got to figure out and coordinate with the fire department and first responders and actually um, work through SOPs or standard operating procedures for staff as to how these uh, access points are going to be um, operated and managed um, during off times and during event times. Um, so again, the SOP might include uh, working with the first responders uh, and knowing what to do in those situations. And that could be anything from uh, using Knox boxes to some of them have uh, readers that can, uh, on the uh, Opticon readers that can operate the gates as the first responders approach. Um, we did not go with that situation here. We did use uh, Knox box um, type of, of, of operations. The other things to consider though are in an SOP is how are you going to process vehicles during events? How long is the process cycle per vehicle? How many vehicles can you queue up before you're causing issues on the approaching roadways? 
Um, you, you need to, to consider these things because that will determine or could determine uh, where the location of the protection is actually placed. And this is just a quick example of uh, the, of, of the uh, fire lane um, uh, approval that uh, had to be done for this project. And it does show all of the different locations of the gates and where they are uh, so that the first responders and fire folks know exactly uh, how to access and, and what they're going to be dealing with should they have to uh, access the venue. Um, another spot defense example is a popular venue in downtown Las Vegas. Maybe many of you have been there, and that's Fremont Street. Fremont Street is the host to 22 million people per year for concerts and events. And as you can see from this photo, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty packed uh, venue at times. Um, and just recently, they uh, installed really super bright uh, LED lights on the overhead canopy for the, the shows that happen uh, multiple times per hour every day out there. And funny enough, uh, Rob and I actually began looking at this project, <laughs> but I think it was back in 2017. Uh, so it's been a while ago, but I'm happy to say that uh, we finally have uh, everything constructed and in place. Uh, just like uh, the other uh, spot defenses, you want to make sure that your perimeter is, is uh, protected and has some sort of mitigation uh, so that the, the actual plaza or the area that people gather uh, is protected. And that was, a, that was the case here. We did a site review, identified all the various locations that needed to have um, uh, some kind of uh, security put in, some kind of a mitigation measure to uh, seal up those access points uh, so that that uh, entire pedestrian plaza under the canopy specifically uh, had some protection. Uh, it did require a lot of, again, coordination with the Fremont Street Management Team and the Fire and Rescue Team to determine uh, operational and maintenance needs. And so that, that led to, um, having to put in uh, different types of, of bollards as well. We, we ended up putting in some retractable bollards and uh, some removable bollards. And that was simply just to um, be able to accommodate fire and rescue and the operations of the Fremont Street experience itself. Um, there were several unique uh, elements on this project. Uh, one of them being uh, basements that extended out into the plaza and up into the street area, even near the curb line in some cases. So if you can imagine, that really does, doesn't leave a lot of opportunity to do much underground uh, work, much less uh, put bollards in the ground. Um, but we were able to, to work through that and, and, uh, and make it work. Uh, the other thing that was kind of interesting here, and this, is, this goes back to some things that Rob said in his presentation. Um, there are crash gates that we installed in the public roadway right away. And I, I have heard people tell me that this perhaps is one of the only locations in the country where this type of, of high security crash gate um, has been installed actually on a public roadway. Um, they've been installed like in many other locations, obviously, but in a public roadway, this is perhaps one of the first ones. Um, and uh, so the reason that we did that is because every uh, about two, two times per hour, um, they shut the, the street down uh, so that the pedestrians and the, and the folks that gather along Fremont Street can enjoy and watch the overhead show that, that, that goes on. And what was happening was they, they were formally using plastic traffic barriers that, that Rob had mentioned. Uh, they would pull them out uh, right before the show would, would, would start and then uh, they'd pull the plastic barriers off when the show was over. And uh, that just was not a safe way to do it. Um, interesting too, this project, when we first started looking at it, um, the idea was to have everything automated as much as possible. Matter of fact, uh, the, the thought was if they could just push a button in the control room that would actually um, shut down all the house lights, 
turn the traffic signals off and close the gates and start the show up. Uh, that was really what they were looking to do. Um, we got pretty close to that. We actually came up with a 15 step process that closes the roadway down. And it starts with uh, some warning signs, uh, warning vehicles that the roadway is gonna close in two minutes. And then there's a series of uh, yellow and red lights from each direction that flushes out the area that's gonna be closed down. And then uh, actually the gates are, are manually closed. Uh, and then uh, the signals turn red and uh, the pedestrian signs say, go ahead and walk. And then the overhead show begins. Uh, like I said, there's actually about 15 steps to that. Uh, and then there's a, a, the reversal of that is actually only about eight steps to open it back up. But the feedback we've gotten from Metro Police is that they are really, really pleased with the crash gates and that everyone feels so much safer uh, with the crash gates versus the plastic barriers that were previously used. So, uh, one of the things is that we, we, we often ask ourselves if we are really making a difference. And uh, while the, the not intentional terrorist attacks, I think the next few slides will show that I think we are making a difference. Um, these are in contrast to what I think Rob was showing, where people were getting through the, the mitigation measures. I don't know the details of, of these crashes, but what I do know is when I look at these photos, I see that um, if the bollards were not there, um, it's most likely there would have been injuries and or perhaps fatalities. We won't know because thank goodness uh, the bollards stopped them. And while Again, we don't know a lot about these, these uh, incidents. It is, it is quite apparent that the mitigation does work. Um, this one I do know a little bit about. Um, this is actually during in, in a construction zone, believe it or not. And I, I think this vehicle was going about 50 miles an hour, believe it or not, and uh, uh, ran into the, to the bollards. And it was a, a DUI situation. And uh, the thing I like to show here on this particular video is, is it's the same crash, but if you do look down the, the row of bollards after the crash, you can see that they, they were very effective. Um, they're, they're really all in, in alignment. Um, they, I don't even think they wiggled a bit. So um, they were very effective and did their job. The other thing you see here is there, were, there are pedestrians that are out there, uh, though um, it was after the fact, but again, uh, these are just good examples of, um, I think the bollards are, are actually working. So I, th I think it's clear we're making a difference, uh, whether it's zone defense or spot defense. Uh, it takes advocacy and education, as Rob was mentioning, to get projects like this done and implemented. So I challenge each one of us out there to continue to educate and advocate. And I think with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back to you, Matt. Thank you. All right, Shannon, thank you very much. Um, that was truly informative and uh, really uh, a very interesting presentation. Um, I'm gonna sign off here. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and we will see you at our next Proto Talk in the coming future. Thank you everyone and have a good day. Yep. <laughs>